All right, welcome back to the Flipping Junkie Podcast. This is episode 173. I've got Doug Price on the show with me today. And Doug has, he's got over 20 years of professional experience. He's been involved with house remodeling for much of his professional career, helping homeowners make the most of their homes. But more recently, Doug started investing in real estate to improve communities through the purchase and renovation of underperforming property. So for the last four and a half years, Doug has owned and operated Journey Properties, which is doing uh, business as JP Homebuyers in Roanoke, Virginia. And through JP Homebuyers, Doug has been helping motivated sellers quickly transition away from unwanted properties. And to date, you know, he's bought or assigned roughly 75 properties in Roanoke Valley. So it's really cool. I'm glad to have you on the show, Doug. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Danny. Appreciate it. Yeah. So let's, let's just get into the story so people know, you know, about you and how you got interested in this business. What, what gave you that start? What sparked that interest? Well, I mean, it goes back a long way for me. I was raised by my grandparents and uh, my grandfather was a realtor. Uh, he was a broker as well as a developer. Uh, he had some properties as well that he had rental. And um, through that process of just sitting around the dinner table, I started to pick up a lot of the lingo, I guess. Um, after getting married, my, uh, my wife and I bought our first house as a fixer upper and kind of went to it and sold it for a profit. We did that a next time and a next time. So we lived in several properties as we kind of renovated them and flipped them and not really calling it flipping. We just called it bargain hunting, bargain hunting I guess, yeah. because we, you know, we'd, we'd go out of our way to find the best property at the cheapest price. And, uh, and a lot of times that property needed some TLC. So um, <clears throat> doing that several times, we kind of got, we wanted to do that more and actually do some renovations and flip and do it more intentionally, but we didn't have the money to do it. So, Time goes on, life happens, uh, continued kind of the career path for a long time. And I got hooked into uh, some podcasting. I was working for a, a commercial installation company, actually. So I was on the road a lot hmm. and started doing a lot of podcasting. And the entertainment podcast ran out pretty quick because I would blow through, you know, time and a half. I'd, I'd blow through an entire season of whatever the murder mystery was I was listening to. So I started doing some self-education and came across um, multiple podcasts, but one of them being uh, John Lee Dumas, EO mm. Fire, or yeah. uh, Entrepreneur on Fire. And every day I was driving my wife nuts <laughs> because I would come home, I had some plan. I'd, I'd go to my notebook at my computer and start writing down the plan of whatever business I was going to launch. And through that process, came home one time and I said, I'm an idiot. Like I heard the podcast today we need to be doing. It's this guy talking about getting into real estate with no money down. And she goes, well, we don't have any money. And I said, yeah, no, that's the point. Like no money down. You can buy real estate with no money. And she goes, well, that's not real. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's not either, but I'm going to look at it. So started discovering wholesaling. And, you know, I'm still working full time. And I keep listening to all these different podcasts. Flipping Junkie was one of them included. Um, several others that I'm sitting there listening to on a regular basis. And as I'm listening to these things, I'm like, I just need to do something. So finally I tell her, I'm like, I'm going to start mailing letters to people. And she's, she's going, who are you mailing letters to? And what are you going to say on them? And I said, I'm going to say, I want to buy their house. And I don't know who I'll mail them to. <laughs> <laughs> so I pulled a tax delinquent list from here in town, which is no charge. You just email them basically here in Roanoke. It's a mess of an old Excel file, but um, got that list, mailed, I don't know, 60, 80 letters. It wasn't very many, you know, hand wrote the envelopes, each one of them. And lo and behold, I got a couple calls and nice. I got my first deal. Oh, wow. Um, got my first what deal from that. It was like, of, of 60 to 80. Yeah. That's yeah. Incredible. Yeah. It was like, it was like a $6,000 assignment on it. And I looked at my wife and I'm like, this is real. Like, okay, th this is real. I need to make a company name. <laughs> like I didn't even have a company name yet. I didn't know if I, what I was going to do. That's what I'm loving most about the story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, doing so what I went ahead and done when yeah. it needs to be done. Absolutely. So, um, went ahead and made a company name, started spending some more time doing that, reinvested that money and more. I did some postcards then a couple more leads, a couple more deals and slowly grew that. 
over about a six or eight month period. And I started to look at my wife and say, I think I could do this full time, but we don't really want to because we were just setting the money back to start buying properties, kind of that Burr principle out of bigger pockets. Mm -hmm. That was the long range goal was to start buying property. And then I got called into the office at work and they said, hey, I suppose you noticed we didn't have much work coming up on our schedule. I said, yeah, I, I did notice that. Well, we don't need an installation manager when there's no installations to manage. So unfortunately, we have to terminate positions. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, called my wife from the office because it was a company car. I drove there and said, hey, you want to come get me? <laughs> uh, we're going to give this a shot full time. And for the last four and a half years, I've been doing this full time. And now it's kind of branched out into buying properties and holding those. I've done a couple of flips as well. And yeah, it, it's formed two partnerships that are outside of Journey Properties now where I buy properties and hold those or, or flip those. And it's just kind of a growing business. And uh, it, it's been, it's been a up and down ride. Um, but as, as they always are, I guess, in, in this business. But it's been, a good, it's been a good journey getting where we're at. Yeah, no, I, I like that story a lot. And, you know, mostly because you're doing, you were doing the things that needed to happen at the moment. You know, it's like there, there's probably a million things to still study and learn, but, you know, you just said, I'm just going to send some letters out. It's like, well, yeah. who and what is it going to say? And, and, you know, some people could take that question and spend a year on it. What, what, what should this letter say? Yeah. You know, well, I, basically just to say that you want to buy their house in so many words, right? Yeah, okay. exactly. Have a couple additional things to it, but let's not overcomplicate this. Like, let's just let them know I'm interested in making them an offer to buy their house. I know they're not selling it. Well, and it's so funny. I got a call from a lady probably about a year ago and she called a number that I hadn't used since that time. Hmm. So I, I get this call and, I'm, and I finally asked the lady on the phone. I said, how did you, how did you get my number? And she said, well, honey, you mailed me a letter and I'm like, wow, that's been sitting in your drawer for two, two and a half years. I don't know. Uh, it ended up not being anything, but it was just funny that something like that, when you send out mail like that, you never know who's going to pick that letter up and when it's going to be, I think can sit there for a long time. But you know, you kept, you kept an open mind about it too, right? Because in hearing this, like already my mind is telling me different things that, you know, I would think and other you know, people listening probably think when they hear about these kinds of things is, you know, but, but, but where I am, they're receiving a ton of mail. So that situation where it's that person's calling me several years later is not likely to happen because they're already getting a ton of mail. We can talk ourselves out of all of it, right? But, but keeping that open mind and just doing it. And then you find that, you know, even as competitive as the market is in a lot of places, that kind of situation still happens, still will happen. And it's just not considering making assumptions again about every kind of scenario and talking yourself out of doing something. Well, yeah. it's so easy to talk yourself out of action mm. because it's so easy to sit and learn. It, it's easy to listen to a podcast. It's easy to order a mentoring program. I, I sat down with a gentleman. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. It's probably been about two years ago now sat down, had coffee. He had spent upwards of $30,000 mm. in mentoring programs. It's and I said, yeah. yeah. And I said, how many deals have you done? He goes, well, I haven't done any yet. I haven't started my marketing. And I looked at him and I'm like, I've been doing this for two at that point. I've been about two, two and a half years full time, somewhere in that range. And I said, I've never paid a dime to anybody for anything. All I've done is podcasting. All I've done is read books. All I've done is go on YouTube and take a lot of stumbles <laughs> as I, as I maneuvered through the dark. Sometimes it felt like, but I put action behind the stuff I'd learned. And that's the hard part, right? Is taking that step to do the action. And so many people miss that. Yeah, I know that's, that's such a huge, huge point. And, you know, some of my, my non-real estate friends, you know, I've had these conversations recently with a, a lot of, uh, you know, th this, this idea about how people learn, right? And so I think, you know, mostly we're brought up in school as a passive learning. We sit there and we're told all these things. Yep. Well, that, that doesn't, you know, unless there's an interest, you know, there, there's not really much that's going to get absorbed that way. 
and, and even with the interest, even with you know trying to study these things, you, you only pick up so much because it's not really, you're not active, you're not, not including everything, every part of your being in this thing. And when you take action, you do because you're, you're putting yourself out there, right? You're, you're yeah. taking action and seeing what comes up next. And that means facing fear and, and all of that kind of stuff. So did you have any fear when that phone rang for those first times? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, not only did I not know what to say in the letter I had sent, <laughs> if I had another opportunity, I'm sure I would craft that differently. Um, but but why the phone... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But when the phone rang, I'm I, I'm sure if I go back, I was probably fumbling over myself. Um, and thankfully, the guy that I met, the only reason he went with my offer, I don't think it was because I had like this, um, you know, this, this presence or anything of knowledge when I went out there, because I know I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, what it came down to was the company I was up against here in town really kind of insulted him. And they really talked his property down to him. And he didn't like that. And he said, when you came in here, you didn't talk my property down. I, mm -hmm. I know what I got. I know it's a mess. That's why I'm selling it. Like I can't afford to do what I need to do to it. So just listening to the person, talking to them, you know, there's a reason they've called you in the first place. They want to sell a house. So listening and asking questions to get them to open up are the best things I've learned in doing this. I don't think I asked a whole lot of questions back then <laughs> and I probably didn't listen real well, but, uh, but I guess I didn't say the wrong thing to him. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, there's, there's gold right there in what you said too. And when somebody felt insulted and I can, I can imagine, you know, what the other company probably did was just go in there and using tactics to say, it's going to need this. It's going to need that. Oh, this is oh, this is a mess. Oh, this is horrible. Well, oh, this is going to cost a fortune. And, you know, I think a lot of people just know that that I know what you're doing, right? You're, you're tearing this up so you can lowball me. So the whole time the person's anticipating this, like this insulting offer. Whereas if you, you know, like what you did was, was had a little bit more tact and, and just, you know, walked around and looked at it and took all that in, but didn't need to try to manipulate the person by making all these statements. I think there's a fine balance in all of that, that people need to find what fits their own personality because it's, yeah. you know, I, I couldn't do that stuff either. I couldn't go in and, and, and act like that. That's just not me. It doesn't feel right. Right. Well, like I say, people know, generally when people call somebody like us, they know what they have. They know they're in over their head. There's a reason they haven't paid their taxes. There's a reason they're behind on repairs. There's a reason they haven't had a renter in the house for the last year, whatever, whatever it is, there's a reason. So they, they know they're up against the wall. Yeah. I want to also go back into your story too, because I love that you guys started, you and your wife started by buying, you know, you know, bargain hunting and getting the deals, you know, that way. And just looking yeah. at it, I just want a house that I can put some equity and like put sweat equity into and, you know, do the fix up and all that kind of stuff. Um, I actually did that. My was my first deal as well. I bought a HUD home to live in that needed a ton of work. And I think it was like a 40 K profit in, in three years, which was magnificent. Um, you know, and then being able to live there too and, and all that kind of stuff. So w were there anything, anything special about how you went about that? Or was, were you just looking for houses that needed, you know, some repair and, and, uh, <laughs> The worse it looked in the pictures, the more I was interested in it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can't say the same for my wife, but um, I think what we did, um, honestly, we just saw she was really good at seeing the potential of a house. Um, her decorating skills are pretty uh, sharp. So I can build the wall. She just makes sure I get the right thing on the wall once it's mm -hmm. built, right? So we made a good team whenever we did that. And um, I remember the first house we bought, I kind of just tore into it and uh, you know, we're, we're 22, 23 at the time and uh, tore into it. And she walks into the room after I had been tearing off paneling and everything. And whoever hung the paneling had decided to find the studs by using a hammer to just break out the wall. That'll work. Yeah. Yeah. It worked quite nicely. Uh, Cause they did, they found the studs. Um, but in the process of that, she's looking at me and she's like, what do we do now? And I said, well, I guess we'll put it back together. And she just starts crying. 
And I said, why don't you, why don't you go back to the apartment? Cause we still had the apartment <laughs> at the time that we were living in. And I said, why don't you go back there and I'll just kind of clean this up and we'll go from there. <laughs> so we got in, our, in over our head out of the gate, but we, uh, we came out all right. So that was a fun experience and kind of from there we did a few more. But you learned, right? I mean, you learned yeah. some things from that. I mean, my first one, I learned that I didn't want to do the repairs. Oh, uh, yeah. That was just not <laughs> my thing. <laughs> it's nice as a hobby, but it's not nice as a career path. Yeah, and I think one of the moments where that really struck me to the core of, like, I absolutely do not, I think was, like, hanging a light fixture on on the wall that going up the stairs. You know, one of those things where your mind mentally, you're like, okay, like, 15 minutes, right? Yeah. 15 minutes to do this. I mean, I already got the old one off. All I got to do is hook this up, mount it to the box, you know, and it's good to go. Well, the stupid nuts and the screws and stuff wouldn't fit right. And so there I am, like, I don't know, I think I ended up with a saw against the wall trying to cut down this, this bolt and like, you know, have it dragging my knuckles across the wall. And <laughs> it's yeah. just like one of those like stubborn push through instead of thinking it through what, what I should do here. Moments where yeah. I was like, this is ridiculous. What am I doing? <laughs> you know just like there, there's no point in me learning how to do all of this stuff but anyway the bloody knuckles kind of helped to make that decision for me yes it, it does yeah you had told me uh you know before the call a little bit earlier today you you had said that you guys had you had done some recently some really good deals and you want to share a couple of those yeah so i've had a couple this year um let's see i'll share the i'll share the one that's um most likely resonates with people um, because follow up is um, <laughs> it's monotonous and you and you just never really know if it's going to lead to anything. Um, I think I'd mentioned to you before, maybe through the Facebook group or something, that I've tried several different CRMs over the years. Uh, part of the reason I guess I'm on this call is because I landed with a flip pilot with you all, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it is great stuff, but. Um, but in that process of changing CRMs, every time you go kind of that, through that process of clearing out, you know, the cobwebs, I, I was clearing out the cobwebs. I was moving stuff over to a new CRM and I came across one lead and I'm sitting there and I'm looking at all the times I'd hit this lady and I'm like, I, I, I don't, I don't need to call her again because every time she's put me off. So I trashed it. Well, like two days later before that, version of the other CRM expired. I just, I don't know what it was. God thing. I don't know. I'm like, I need to, I need to go back and get her number real quick before she's gone. So I go back in, I log in, I get, I get her number out and I call her the last time, right? This is it. I'm not going to do it again. I call her and the whole story was her niece had moved into this condo temporarily, temporarily four years oh, earlier when she had moved out to go to Utah so here, four years later, niece is still living there and she has to get her out before she'll show me the property. That's, that's been the call every time. For the, mm -hmm. I mean, I've been following up with this lady for probably eight months. So I call her last time and she says, my niece is moving out. She bought a house. I'm going to be there next week. Can we meet? I'm like, huh. wow. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we meet. I go through the condo. It's really not that bad. It's really, I mean, it's a lot of cosmetic. It needs updated. It's a little bit older. But go through the condo, look at it. The biggest opportunity ad was that the basement was not finished. Full walkout basement, hmm. not finished, but it was roughed in and ready to go for a third bathroom, a third bedroom. So I look through it all and I make her an offer. And she would not, you know, you always try to get the price from the seller first, right? He who gives the price first loses. That's kind of the typical mantra in this business well <laughs> we're sitting there looking at it she would not give me her price so i finally make her an offer standing in her kitchen and she says you're only two you know she said you're only five thousand dollars off of what mm -hmm. i thought it would be and i said okay well then we're, we're we're not too far apart she said well i have two other people coming after you to look at it i'm like oh. <laughs> <laughs> like oh here we go <laughs> She calls me the next day and says, come over and meet me. Let's do the contract. So I go over, meet her, sit down, talk to her. And she said, kind of like the gentleman I started with, and I've had several people over the years tell me this, that we've been able to work together. 
that she said, you walked through and you were very professional. You didn't tell me the property was in bad condition. And she said, one gentleman that came out actually gave me a better price than you. Hmm. But he told me he was doing me a favor because the property was in such bad condition. And she said, I just looked at him and said, you can go ahead and leave. <laughs> wow, yeah, it's so amazing. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's probably a lot of gold in there, but I think the biggest takeaway for me was that just keep the leads. Once you have somebody's number, just keep hitting them because you never know when they're going to come back around. And uh, I ended up, I, I put, I put $13,000 on that when I marketed it to my buyer's list, right? So that's a pretty good assignment. I, I usually average about eight. Um, I'd, I'd love to get that a little higher, of course, but I usually hit about eight. So I sent it out to my buyers and I kind of have this rule whenever I have multiple bids. Um, and I knew, you know, you know how you get those properties sometimes, Danny, where you just know it's like, oh, I got something. Mm -hmm. Because I had buyers lighting me up. And the first thought had, was, it, oh, crap, I asked too little. Well, so yeah, so this is what I do in situations like that. I always tell people, if I see that happen, I say, I'm expecting multiple offers, right? So I set the stage before I ever meet with a buyer. Secondly, then what I do is the, the buyer that's first one to the table. So when he gives me an offer, if it's 25 bucks, that's an offer. I don't care, whatever it is. If he says, I'm going to give you an offer, then I, I log that offer and he's the last one at the table then is what I do. So you're not punished for being first. Hmm. So when I get all these offers in, which I think I had six offers come in on that property, I called him back and I said, okay, you, you need to give me your highest and best because you have been drastically beat. <laughs> Cause he had given me a full price offer on site. And I ended up getting a, a wholesale fee on that for $29,000. Oh man, that's awesome. And, and that was, a, and that was a fast close because that lady had her act together and it was a very smooth transaction. Mm, yeah. I'd take that all day long. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, I would take a few more if I could find them. <laughs> no, that's awesome. And so you, you said you would, so people that, you know, they more than doubled what you were asking for your assignment fee. Yeah. They did. They did. Yeah. Did you let them know what the assignment fee was when you, when you marketed it or just told them what the price you were asking for was? No, I never market the property with the assignment fee on it. I mean, I, I market the property as a total cost with the assignment right. in there. Um, now they did see it on the HUD when they came through there. Uh, mm -hmm. I did just leave it on there. I've got a great title company that takes care of that. So on the seller side of it, they really are on the purchase side of it, my side of the HUD. They don't even go through that because it doesn't apply to them. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't generally leave something that large on there. I don't generally have an assignment that fee or that, that large on there. But when, uh, when they said they would take care of it and make sure it got closed with that 29,000 on the HUD, I went ahead and did it yeah. and it was fine. Oh, beautiful. Did that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful deal. And so, you know, when you said there's probably a lot of gold in there in, in that story, as far as how things happen and just one statement from a competitor, you know, is all it takes to, to ruin it for them, even if they offered more, you know, that one statement killed the deal for them. I think there's so much there. But then you said, really, the bigger thing, though, here is I wouldn't be there even having this opportunity had I not followed up and been persistent with my follow up, even though my mind was telling me every time I talked to her, she, you know, cast me, you know, puts me off. And, you know, so why waste my time? Should I waste my time with another contact? Is she going to do the same thing? But you still did it anyway. Um, so how are you now, you're going to like the way I'm doing this here. So how, how are you, how are you now <laughs> making sure that you're doing this follow-up with your, your leads that you're getting? Yeah, I do like the way you did that. Very subtle. Um, <laughs> uh, so just recently moved over to flip pilot, as you know, and I've been following you guys on Facebook for, um, probably the better part of your beta group. I don't even know how I managed it, but I, I got into your alpha group at some point and I wasn't even in your system. So I kind of snuck in. I don't know how I did that. I think um, I probably just let you in because I didn't take the time to check and see if you were a customer or not. It might have been. It might have been. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
at the time when I logged in, I didn't realize that was the case. But after being in the group a short time, I was like, oh, I don't think I'm supposed to be here, but I'm going to stay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I kind of saw it grow out of the alpha into the beta. And then once it got to a certain <laughs> point that the releases I saw coming through in the comments, you know, were, were kind of coming around to, hey, this is really good stuff. Um, I went ahead and joined in with the group. I guess now I've been in there probably two months close to it. And I love kind of the, the Trello feel to it, I guess, uh, if you're familiar with that, where you kind of have that, uh, is that right, Trello? Tre Trello. Mm -hmm. Trello, yeah. So um, I love that feel where you kind of create that whiteboard that moves along uh, the, the, the pipeline. And the great thing I've seen about Flippilot so far for what I do as a wholesaler, as well as a, a property owner, is you can kind of customize that to be what you want it to be. You're not locked in. So many of the like Podio platforms and other things that are out there, they're very regimented and locked in. And I've enjoyed being able to set it up the way I want to see it roll. And then the automated follow-ups have been a great addition too, because especially with online marketing, that's primarily what I do is online marketing. You get a lot of people that at two o'clock in the morning, for whatever reason, fill out a form, but never call you back. I can go in with that automated no contact made basically is what I've created as a, a just a follow up that just automates that over and over again. Yeah. So once they finally pick up the phone and call or they text back, then it gets real. But these people that just kind of fill out those forms, I'm not spending a lot of time calling people um, like you do with direct mail and things like that. Yeah. So it, it's been a good addition. It's been a very good addition. Nice. How, how often, you know, how long is your sequence for something like that for the no contact? I think I've got the no contact set out at right around three months, I believe. Oh, wow. Yeah. Huge. And I forget how many, I forget how many hits are on that, but um, I got an email too in there, some text blasts to go out with it too. So yeah, I try, I try to hit all three elements there because uh, I do call them a couple of times in that time frame, but yeah. not much. Yeah. Well, that's what I love about the business, right? Is every bit of it's worth it. I mean, mainly, especially because you're not having to physically do it for all the touches, all the follow up, yeah. but, but more so because, you know, in this business, like you just said, what was it? Tw what was it? 29,000. Mm -hmm. You don't know ever yep. which one of those leads or potential leads even is the next $29,000 deal. Right. And that's kind of like the thing I always kind of would think about is like whenever I started feeling lazy about returning a call or something saying, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. It's like, oh, wait a minute though. If that is that hot deal or that, that one of those <laughs> one in 10 motivated sellers that says I'm done, I'm done with this. Get over here, make me an offer. I don't care what it is. You know, you just, you never right. know when is that one. Well, and I will say too, along with that follow-up sequence that I do now, I, I've been getting in the habit in the last few months, six months, I make an offer to everybody. Even if I've never talked to them, if I have your number or your email address, you're going to get an offer. Yeah. And a lot of people, a lot of people overcomplicate that process, I feel like, and I'm guilty of that myself over the years. Um, what I do now is I have a form in my Google Docs. I go in and enter 70% of the Zillow price and I put their name and their address. That generates a letter. They get that in the form of PDF in their inbox or I've even mailed them to. And every so often, you'll get somebody that calls you back and says, keep calling me. I've never gotten a deal from that yet, but I know a lot of guys that do. Yeah. And uh, maybe next time I'm on your on your podcast, I'll have a deal to share with you from <laughs> blind offering people, yeah. because it's just a number, right? It's just something to kind of kind of start the conversation if they won't call you back. Yeah, I like that. That's one of the things that I want to add into Flip Pilot for some of the automation is to be able to allow you to do that without having to use the Google Doc, you know, to be able to yeah. have it just automatically be a part of your sequence or something if you if you do that. But but we'll we'll be looking at that in the future. There's a lot of different directions we want to go. I wanted to ask you real quick too, is, is what is your, your sort of, uh, you know, daily use of the system? Like what, what are you doing when you go into that system into flip pilot? Yeah. Can you still see me? No, I lost the video on here, but I still got your audio. Let me, uh, let me do that right there. There, there we go. All right. Um, so, uh, daily use right now, what I'm doing is I create, um, 
and I know we we communicated some a little bit about this with the uh, the color changes there on the on mm -hmm. the status. Um, so I use it a lot for daily follow up with tasks with the tasks of calling email or whatever it is. Uh, and then I also go through there and any new leads I have roll straight into that new category on the board. So I, I go and of course get those calls within a couple hours coming in. Um, how, do you have I, them I, in? how do you have them coming into the system? Do you got, are you using with the webhook and then call rail? Uh, call rail and then Zapier through, um, I guess I needed Zapier for my carrot site. Yeah. I forget now how I set that up. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So yeah, I've got those two rolling into there and uh, it works great. It works great. Cool. And then you go in daily and do, you said you're, you're using like the, the schedule contact. So you, you have it, your, your workflow set up to where the new ones come in and then you move them into, you need to make contact with them. Is that right? So I've got new and then I've got qualified. Um, if, if it's new and they don't pick up the phone, the first time I call them, then they just go in and no contact made follow up and that's automated from there. I'll hit them a couple times with a call. Eventually it comes up where I send them uh, an offer email. Uh, outside of that, it's all automated with emails and, uh, and text going back to them. And then if I talk to them on the phone, they roll into qualified and depending on what the conversation is there, they move over from, uh, they move over from qualified to a scheduled appointment. Mm -hmm. And then once I have that scheduled appointment, then of course they're getting an offer and then it's a follow up from there on the, on that offer having been made. Yeah. And then, then the backside of it's then the deal structure. Once it's, once it's under contract, I've got a few different categories there to fall into. Okay. For, for working the deal once it's under contract. Yep. Yep. Are you, are you using the checklists? Yes. Yes. Uh, on several of the categories. And I, I, if I was, uh, if it wasn't for COVID-19 <laughs> or whatever we're calling it today, uh, and the uh, and the kids being home from school, I'd be at the computer and I could show you everything or pull it up and uh, <laughs> yeah. and go through it. But uh, with all that going on, I had to share the computer with the kids for uh, their classroom today. So I don't remember all of the different things I've put in there, but yeah, I do have the checklist used in there to kind of keep everything moving through that that pipeline. Yeah, to make sure you're you're doing all the things at each step that you, you have. Yeah, use using the checklist before I move it through the pipeline. Probably a better way to put it. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Well, really appreciate you and uh, the feedback that you've given in that group that you got into that you <laughs> we weren't supposed to be That's in, right. <laughs> but, but it all it all worked out for the best. And maybe you're supposed to be there, but um, yeah, you've given some some feedback and some great ideas for improvement, and I really appreciate that. And we've we've done. Uh, you know, a lot of those we've, we've tried to add in there recently. Right before you this. have. Yeah. That, that's been the great thing I've seen is you're very responsive. I mean, very responsive, not just to me, but everybody in the group. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like that. I've been with a couple different companies, CRM wise that are not that responsive. They kind of have their systems built out and that's the way it is. So adapt. And you all are not that way from what I've seen thus far. Um, you're willing to take advice and input and kind of build from there. So I appreciate that. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely, the first iteration of, of flip pilot, it was, I know what the, the, the system's supposed to do and it's going to do all these million things. And as soon as we launch, it's going to be perfect and found out that that's not a good way to go. Cause my idea of what things should do and how they should work is not everybody else's. <laughs> right. So in this one, it was more of let's, let's get, you know, feedback every step of the way. So that way we don't get too far off track, you know, of what the majority of our, you know, base wants to, wants to see in the system. So yeah, so well, you've done a good job. Fun. Yeah. It's a lot more <laughs> fun with the, getting that feedback too. Cause then, you know, it's like you, you get to hear and the team loves to hear too. When people are saying, Oh, we love this. This is like a great feature. You know, thank you so much for putting it in. You know, it's, it's so much better than, you know, them working on something and then saying it's done and then they got to move on to something else. There's never any kind of feedback and seeing what it's doing for people that are actually using it, which has been great. Yep. Yeah, so that was the you know one deal. I think you said there was another deal that you did recently that was good. Do you want to share the details of that one? <laughs> yeah, that that was a home run right there. That might have been a grand slam actually. Yeah, uh, I've been doing this for four and a half years, and I have never had an assignment even close to this one. Um, this one came as a referral, so there was no cost even. In it. it was a neighbor. It was a it was a couple from our uh, one of our small group Bible studies we had years ago. 
and they had told me about this house that was a hoarding house next to them. Mm. And I, uh, I said, well, stay in touch with it. If you ever see anything happen over there. Well, sure enough, they called me and said, Hey, this guy was taken out of here in an ambulance. I don't think he's coming back home. It's an elderly gentleman lived there alone. So I tried to, uh, I used some skip tracing to try to find numbers. Could only find his number. I knew he wasn't going to pick up. So, um, drove over there a few days later and just drove by and lo and behold, there's a gentleman there dealing with getting some of the abandoned cars out from in the house, out in front, in the front of the house. Mm -hmm. Well, in the process of that, we kind of started talking and he gave me the number of one of the sons. So I called him right there from the driveway and I said, Hey, I'm interested in your house. I didn't know what you were going to do with it. And he said, Oh, we got to get it cleaned out. It's hoarded to the ceiling through the whole house. And I mean, this is a big house, like 3,300 square feet. Oh, wow. And I couldn't necessarily see inside of it that well, but I could see the front door had been cut off the house to get the gentleman out by the EMTs. So I knew it was pretty bad. But <laughs> in the process of talking to him, I said, well, when you're ready to do something, please let me know. So he said, well, I got to get the POA and all that set up. So we talked for about the next three weeks. I called him for you know, once a week, every week, he tell me, call him back. We don't have the, I think the fourth week I called him, he said, we've got it. When can we meet? And I said, let's meet out there tomorrow. He said, you don't want to go in the house. So we go out to the house and Danny, I've been in some hoarded houses, but this one, uh, actually I put a video up on my Facebook page over at, uh, JP home buyers. If somebody wants to see it, it was hoarded virtually to the ceiling everywhere wow it was it was tunnels getting through the house wow and uh the smell in the house i mean you you just can't even imagine so we go through it we come out in the driveway i said what do you want for the house he said well, we got to get it cleaned out first i know nobody's going to buy it in this way and i said well well how are you going to clean it out he said my sister wants to go through some things my other brother here wants to get a couple things out of there and I said, how are you going to find, because it was little stuff they wanted. I said, how are you going to find anything in there? I mean, how, how long is it going to take you? And he said, more time than I care to think about. And I said, well, what, if you sold it right now, what would you want for it? And he said, my bottom line is 80. Well, I had figured about 105 offering price before I went out. And after seeing it, I knew it would need to be a little bit less, but not that much less. Mm -hmm. So I said, if we do it today, would 85 work for you? So I went up because I'm like, I don't want him calling my competitors. <laughs> I don't want anybody else coming out to this house. And uh, he said, yeah, that'll work. He said, let me talk to my sister. The next day he calls me back and he wants 100,000. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should say his sister wants 100,000. Right, right, right. So we talked and talked and talked on the phone and we ended up at 95, uh, locked it up in front 95,000. And, um, because of the hoarding situation on this one, I wasn't going to send it out to my buyer's list. I, there's no way I could have 50 or 30 or even 10 people. I, I didn't want to go back in the house again. So I called three people that I do business with on a regular basis. Um, one of them immediately came out and looked at it. Uh, the other came out and met me and looked at it. The other called me to never mind on the way there. So, um, because I told him how bad it was and sent him a video I'd filmed inside of it. So the gentleman that came out, <laughs> he's a, uh, international gentleman and the realtor that was with him explained to him, this is a disease the man had, he hoards. Well, he wouldn't go in the house. <laughs> He's oh. like, I don't want a disease. I don't, I don't. We said, no, 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 it's not that kind of disease. I don't want to go in the house. So we stood there and talked. I showed him the video of the house and he goes, I don't need to see that. I'm not going in there. Well, I know the guy. I knew, I knew he would buy it if he saw it. And I said, you're standing 80 feet from the front door and you're getting ready to get in your truck I'm walking over here and looking at it. And he said, okay. So we walked into the house he goes to come out says no 
gets in his truck, leaves. I told the realtor that was with him, I said, he wants it. Call me back. And sure enough, called back, made an offer on it. And uh, ended up assigning that house for a $55,000 assignment. Whoa, fee. nice, nice, nice. Yeah, so absolutely incredible. So uh, I didn't even, I, I've, I've heard about deals like that on podcasts, but I didn't know that was actually a real thing, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, people would kill for that even after a major rehab, you know, to, to be able to have that happen without. He you know, probably doing. will not make, as much when he actually flips it right yeah I, I probably made more than he will yeah yeah i've done that several times too it's just amazing not not that i don't think that i've ever got 55 i think 50 was the most man but that yeah. well it, like, it, well so you you still got me because i only netted 49 625 okay. only <laughs> only yeah oh, poor only yeah dude. poor dog yeah I, I know it was rough <laughs> <laughs> I was happy to pay a commission to the realtor. Happy. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, it's, yeah, that's a, yeah, great deal. And, and just, you know, the, I love walking through them in the different scenarios like that, you know, the situations of what happened, seeing a little bit of the negotiation where, where you have the, the son, you know, telling you already what the number is and then coming back with that always painful. I need to talk to my sister. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, and, and that kind of roller coasters ride is going to happen through a deal and, uh, you know, keeping your cool because you could have immediately heard that and said, you know, gone up automatically right there, you know, trying to lock him up. But if he yeah. already feels like he's got to talk to his sister, even if you offered him 120, he's still going to say he's going to talk to his sister. You know? Well, and I will say the, the biggest, the biggest thing I did for them as a family was I solved the problem of going through the house. Yeah. They, they would have been in that house for years going through the, the stuff that is in there. Uh, I, I mean, he, it, it's kind of funny. I came home uh, the next day, I think, and was channel flipping. And Hoarders, the show was on. You've seen that before? And I was like, well, I'll just tune into that real quick and see what kind of situation they've got. Well, this guy's on there talking about this is one of the worst he's ever seen. And I'm looking at the video and on this, and I'm going, no, <laughs> oh, yeah. it it's not even close to what I was standing in. Yeah. So uh, it it was bad. It was really bad. I haven't ex I've, I've experienced hoarder houses, but the one that I think was the worst, I I got to after it had already been cleaned out, and I heard it secondhand from a neighbor, because an attorney from Atlanta or somewhere called me, and said, "Hey, you know, I know you buy houses. Why don't you go check this one out? Go into the back door." Uh, it's all it's it's open just go look at it and tell me what you can offer and said that the guy was there was a hoarder but we already cleaned it all out and they took out all the carpet and all that kind of stuff well there was a nasty smell in that house I mean it was just it was so horrible even though it had been cleaned out all the carpet gone everything and the walls were filthy up to about knee level maybe yeah so I thought well maybe big dogs or something right and we rehabbed the whole house and then, you know, the neighbor who was chatting me up every time I was over there and, and just like, just would not stop talking, never shared with me the details until after we put it on the market. Then he tells me, you know, oh yeah, no, no, he didn't have dogs. You know, there were no dogs. I said, well, what was the smell? And he said, well, no, I, I was the one that found him. He was lying right there. I guess he had been oh, wow. deceased for a while in the house and nobody knew. And that was the smell. And uh, yeah, so that was, it was interesting to find out after the fact that, but he, the, you know, he had said that the, the guys, you know, was, was storing his urine in three liter bottles and they were stacked wow. to the ceiling. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And using the backyard for number two. So that was, that was interesting. Yeah. Some interesting. Yeah. Well, stuff. thankfully, thankfully this gentleman is in a, a much better uh, condition now. He's actually, uh, in assisted living he uh he's oh, taken he care of by his family yeah so he he got out of the house okay once they got him out they they, they said he's not going back into the house so yeah he's he's doing much better now good i was gonna say i don't want to end the podcast on this heavy <laughs> yeah yeah no doubt no death doubt. thing going on here but like you know so it's good to hear the good news as the the good the good ending to the tale there you you know yeah good deal well and we can put a uh, we can put a link in there in the notes, I guess. Yeah. If people want to see the video of the house, um, yeah, um, take a look at it. Flippingjunkie.com slash one seventy three. That's the episode number, and I'll okay. put the link to 
to uh, Doug's website on there and then also to the that video over over there for you. For yeah, I think I just posted on my website too. So Okay, cool. And then if anyone's listening and wants to reach out to you, I mean, do you mind if anybody contacts you and how should they do that? Well, uh, what do you typically do? Emails and well, cell phone numbers or how do you? No, I'm, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you can, you can do that if you want. Probably an email might be a little bit, you know, better. Okay. I'm going right, to put yeah. that on the website though, because then you end up getting spam because all the scrapers picking up email addresses. Okay. Very good. Uh, yeah, they can reach out to me at uh, Doug at jphomebuyers.com. That is Doug at jphomebuyers.com. All right, Doug, thank you so much for being on the episode. I really enjoyed talking about those, those home run deals that you did and uh, yeah. sharing your experience with uh, the flip pilot. And, uh, and just, uh, yeah, I'm glad that you snuck into the, the Facebook group and we ended up here <laughs> on, on the podcast together. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate your low standards. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you're one of, one of the best in there, so you know, I can see that. <laughs> And, and for everybody listening out there, we did just by the time this episode airs, we, we did just launch Flip Pilot 2.0 out of beta. We've had a lot of companies using it and going through it and it's solid and uh, even decided once, you know, a lot of this COVID-19 Corona stuff happened, you know, we're thinking about, well, how can we help people, you know, if they're, they're trying to cut back and, you know, we don't know, there's a little uncertainty in, in what's going to happen with the economy and all that kind of stuff. You know, let's let's put together a free account, you know, for for newer people or people needing to to watch what they're spending, so that they have uh, the ability to to have an organized business for their flipping business, and then be able to do some of this follow up to reminders, to be persistent and following up. Because you know, I hear a lot of new people saying, "Well, I don't need a system yet because I'm not generating any deals. I'm not getting any deals." I was like, "Well, that's kind of why you need the system. <laughs> you know, you you put." you work on filling it, which is what Doug was talking about. Like he set out and he said, I'm going to send some letters out. He looked at getting these leads in. And if you have a system to put them into, you can put them into it and have these reminders happen so that you stay persistent and consistent following up and getting the deals. And so we've set up that free account. If that's for you, if you'd like to get more involved in it, we've got the paid account where you can set up your integrations with call rail, hook up your website, Gmail, Google Calendar, Drive, all that stuff into it and increase the power. So if you're interested, check it out, flippilot.com. I uh, really appreciate uh, you listening to the podcast. And uh, thanks again, Doug, for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, Danny. Appreciate it. Yep. Have a good one, Doug. You too. All right.